the models accomplished women have for deciding what's next in our lives are pretty faulty at this point. The current models are largely based on what accomplished men do after they reach the pinnacle of their careers. Masculine ideals like early retirement, adventuring and exploring the planet, travel, golf, cocktails with friends, all of those things can feel hollow, and even unfulfilling to accomplished women. And even the traditional feminine pathways of what happens on the other side of the pinnacle of your career, things like grandparenting and having lunch with the ladies, those even feel somehow off. And a lot of the accomplished women who I speak with tell me that they feel sort of guilty and wrong even because they don't want to retire and spend a bunch of time with their grandchildren or volunteer at a local nonprofit or even travel great distances only to sit on exotic beaches or go to international tours with their spouses. There's nothing really wrong with any of those things. It just is that for the intuitive, intelligent women who are working with me, there's just something missing. There's something missing in those, in those ideals that have been cast before us. And so part of the problem is, actually a big part of the problem is none of those really quench that as insatiable desire that accomplished women have for the discovery of complex and remarkable inner landscape of their own souls. So to illuminate and express the most actualized version of yourself, that is actually what an accomplished woman's highest calling is meant to be. But the question is, since the old blueprints are markedly faulty, where is the new blueprint? Where is the blueprint for an accomplished, accomplished woman who wants to meet the most actualized version of herself? What is the pathway to living your highest calling? Well, I have that information and I know where the blueprint is and that's why I'm here for you. So there are a couple of ways that you and I can work together to eliminate your highest calling and to activate your own blueprint for the actualization of your highest and best self. And as you can imagine, this is going to look quite different from the traditional models that we've been exposed to some, from the time we were little kids. So if this is something you'd like to explore with me, I want you to send me an email, robin, R-O-B-Y-N, at drrobinmckay.com and ask me about how we can work together to illuminate your highest calling. I'm here for you. And now is your time to live into that version of yourself. She's got the answers to what's next for you. And with that, let's get on with the show today. <clears throat> I want to share something with you. I just wrote something yesterday in on LinkedIn. And I think it's worthy of a lengthier conversation. If you don't follow me on LinkedIn, head over there and and say hello. I'm over on, I have a weird LinkedIn address. Well, not weird, but it's linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Robin McKay. And then the number one is my username over there. So find me over there. But I want to read this thing I wrote yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, I went down to this new sweetest little Italian market that's in my neighborhood. It just opened recently and I've been wanting to get there do some work, do some writing. I always feel more inspired when I'm writing out in the world versus when I'm staying at home. Although there are times when I love to be here as well. But yesterday was one of those days when I went out, I bought a golden milk with that, you know, turmeric and honey in it, oat milk. And I sat down and I started writing. And this is what came, came in for my LinkedIn post yesterday. And let me just pull this up here. So this is what I wrote. I'm curious to see how this lands for you. Having worked in biotech and healthcare early in my career, and then having worked with hundreds of emotionally intelligent and highly intuitive women leaders in tech and healthcare throughout the years, it is not lost on me that it's still edgy and even dangerous to lead with your spiritual or intuitive perspective at work, especially in the tech and healthcare spaces. And as a result of this, since I've worked with hundreds of emotionally intelligent women leaders who have kept their spiritual beliefs and practices a secret out of fear that they would lose credibility with their colleagues or be thought of as too woo-woo, overly touchy-feely, or just plain weird. So I find this particularly concerning 
especially now when diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging movement has made such inroads into ensuring the psychological safety of so many under other underrepresented groups. So you can think about the work that has been done in corporate around neurodiversity, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, for example, um, the LGBTQ plus community movement in corporate has been huge over the last few years, rightfully so. But this, there's one segment of the population, and by the way, now I'm editorializing just for a second here. There's one segment of the population, which are the intuitive ones, the intuitively gifted ones who have continued to be marginalized in very interesting ways. So here's how I see it play out. In this world in corporate where intellect, logic, and reason are still king, I really believe it's past time to make it completely safe for leaders in tech and healthcare to honor their wisdom and their intuition at work. So when I was writing this, I was thinking about what kind of world do I actually want to live in? And this is what occurred to me. I wrote this, I said, I wanna live in a world where it's not only safe, but it's also expected to speak and lead from the sophisticated perspective of wisdom and intuition. Instead of being coerced into dumbing everything down to accommodate the intellect, which as you know, Einstein always referred to the intellect as a faithful servant and intuition as the sacred gift. So in the end, in this post that I wrote, I said, I wanna live in a world where it's expected to be both professionally esteemed and spiritually intelligent. And I wonder, do you want to live in that world too? Because that's where we seem to be headed. At least there's a movement in that direction. There's a lot of resistance to it too. I will say also, it's not lost on me that when I write things like that on LinkedIn, I have so many colleagues and clients and former colleagues and, and friends who still work in the healthcare space and in tech that even I, every once in a while, have this kind of twinge of nervousness about what are my colleagues going to think of me when I'm over here talking about spiritual intelligence, intuition, channeling, wealth consciousness, all the things I talk about, what are they going to think of me? And for a, for a while, it really created some resistance to me talking about my own spiritual intelligence very broadly because I was more concerned about what my colleagues would think of me. I didn't want them to think I was crazy or weird or anything like that. And that helped. And that happened for the first time many, many years ago, actually, when I was first working in corporate. I was working for a pharmaceutical company out of San Diego. I was doing all of this spiritual work as well. I was going on retreats and I was learning about intuition. And it wasn't even directed at me, but I was on a hiring committee for a new writing, a new writer who was meant to come on board. And this one person interviewed for the position and he, ha he had all of this um, spiritual stuff on his resume. And I don't even remember the content of it, but I do remember my colleagues kind of making fun of him. Like, what does he think putting all of this spiritual stuff on his resume? And this is a clinical writing position. Like, what is that about? And I remember talking to my boss about that afterwards because I was so sensitive to it because I had been doing all of my spiritual work and I thought I was liked and trusted on the team. In fact, I was leading a team and in fact, I was liked and trusted, but I was still pretty sensitive to the, um, the covert, I'll say, criticism of this one person's resume. And granted, this one, the person that I'm referring to didn't have a strong clinical background. So I think it was just kind of more of a shot in the dark for him to see if he could possibly, you know, get a job as a medical writer in a pharmaceutical company, even though his skill set clearly was not appropriate for the, for the position. Mine was. And when I went to my boss and talked to her about that, she said, Oh, Robin, you're so much more than that, though. You don't lead with your spirituality. And she said, and she even alluded to, even if I did, I was still very, very good at my job. And that was my first taste of, I guess I can be in corporate and be professionally well thought of and also have a spiritual practice and perspective that's respected or at least well-regarded. 
But over the years, as much work as I've done with women leaders in corporate, and I talk about corporate, but I mean, what I mean is in tech and also in healthcare, especially, what I've come to, to learn is that there is such a profound sensitivity to our spiritual gifts in the corporate space because I believe there have been so many generations of women who have come before us who have been criticized or even blackballed, I would say, because of who we are, because of our spiritual intelligence, because of our native intuition. And the last thing I think an accomplished woman wants to have happen in her career is for her colleagues to judge her as incompetent or to judge her as any of those other things I mentioned, too touchy-feely or too, too weird, not logical enough, not rational enough too hormonal, like any of those things that might come forward in response to a woman who's leaning into her intuition. So granted, we do have to be very mindful about how we present our intuitions in the corporate space. I do believe that there will be a time in the not too distant future where it will be the case that I wrote about that it will be expected to lead with intuition and wisdom. That will be the norm, not the exception. But the way that we get leading with intuition to be the norm in the corporate environment, in healthcare, in technology, is to be the way showers and the forerunners to our, to our predecessors. We have to be the ones who set the tone. We have to be the ones who stand up and, and honor our intuition, even if other people choose not to. And on an even deeper level than that, what I have found is that we have to be the ones, I have to be the one, and maybe you do too, to be able to be very, very comfortable with being misunderstood or being very, very comfortable with having a perspective that is quite different from the status quo and the bro culture that continue, continues to permeate both the tech space and healthcare. And that really, I believe, is the heart of it, is that there are still so many. Yes, I recognize that we're making inroads in those, in those underrepresented groups being in leadership, as I mentioned. But by and large, in my experience, in both of these spaces, tech and in healthcare, the leadership is still largely masculine and still largely does have a very, I'll call it bro style, of leadership that tends to exclude rather than include and honor traditionally, I would say, feminine assets like intuition and like wisdom. And that is what has to change. And the way that we change it is by recognizing it in ourselves first. When I talk about using intuition in the workplace, one of the difficulties I think that people come to me with is, yeah, but I still have to explain how I know what I know. And yes, I, I understand that. I remember being a young psychologist. I think I wasn't even done with my training yet. And I did have an intuition about something that was going on with one of my patients. My supervisor at the time, she asked me, she said, how, how will you know when this patient is ready to be completed with therapy? And I couldn't articulate what I knew to be true, which was that she's not going to be better on my watch. I knew that, uh, but I couldn't say that. And I'm not sure why I couldn't say that, but I couldn't. All I could say was that, all I could say was that it was a very difficult case and I couldn't even really reverse engineer how I knew what I knew. I just knew that she was not gonna be better on my watch. And in fact, she wasn't. And I think I made it a little bit about my competence. Like if I could do something differently for her, it would probably help. But it was really truly that she was, she had very deep seated depression and she was not gonna get better on my watch. And so I know that that may be kind of a nebulous example of how my intuition worked back then. But if I had been able to say, well, my intuition tells me 
that she has deep seated depression and she's not going to get better on my watch. That would have been so much easier and more straightforward than kind of doing the song and dance that I did, which was try to, to try to explain in logical terms what I knew just in my heart of hearts to be the case. And I think that that is, that is the greatest challenge that intuitives have in the workplace is not knowing exactly how to articulate why we know what we know. I don't think it's our fault that that's the case because I think that there's this insistence in the workplace that you should be able to demonstrate in some kind of empirically supported way why you know what you know. But when we look at how people know things, largely, largely, I think something like 90%, 95% of our decisions are made intuitively and then we make up rational reasons for why we do what we do. Um, some people may just be better at articulating the logical explanation for why they know what they know. I think that the true intuitives, the ones who are profoundly intuitive, have a harder time with that because the logic doesn't necessarily make sense. It, it just, we can feel it in our bones when something is true. Getting people to believe what we think is another thing entirely. I was thinking just now of one of my clients who is a visionary in her field, and she can see where the field is headed. And she gets very frustrated when her colleagues don't believe her and they go and do something different. And then she's proven right, but it comes at great cost and great consequences. And that in fact is a little bit of a leadership conundrum, but it's also a sponsorship conundrum. In other words, if you are an intuitive leader, you don't need everybody to believe you, but you do need a couple of very important people to believe and to validate what you're saying is true. So sometimes the validation does not have to come from you. Sometimes it can come from somebody close to you who's a trusted ally or a colleague or a sponsor who will back you up. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that is an important middle step to gaining ground into the world where reason is in its place, which is as a servant and intuition and wisdom really is primary a primary way of knowing. So I share this with you because one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in my advising practice, in the, the, the spiritual intelligence work that I do with my clients, and even in the burnout recovery work that I do, is that the people who come in to work with me really truly are profoundly intuitive. Most of them can kind of recognize that, Many of them will have put that way back on the back burner and refer to it kind of half-heartedly, if that, and question it, maybe don't trust it themselves because no one else trusted it either when, when they were growing up, certainly. And then in adulthood, they came to, came to learn how important it was to have rational reasons to explain why you're doing what you're doing. And so as a result of that, a lot of the work that I'm doing these days is really around helping my intuitives exercise their intuition and begin to trust it, begin to understand it and begin to use it every single day, every single day in their lives, regardless of if they're at work or at home or wherever they are in the world, to be able to trust your intuition is the bridge into becoming professionally esteemed and, and spiritually intelligent. And you can do both. We have to also have a look at, am I willing to have some people think that I'm too woo for them? Am I willing to? And this is an interesting question. A few years ago, I was meeting with an executive at a large tech company about coming in and working with some of his female leadership team. And I was sharing what I was planning on doing with them and so on. And he just kind of sat back in his chair and he basically told me that I was just a little bit too woo for him, too touchy feely for him. And I found myself sort of embarrassingly in hindsight, but I learned a lot from it. I was embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to tell you this though. I found myself actually agreeing with him and sort of massaging his you know, sensibilities around intuition and around emotion and helping him feel okay with who I am. And kind of in the middle of that conversation, I had this deep awakening, 
this realization that I've spent 20 years developing my abilities as an intuitive. I've spent 20 years honing and refining my capabilities as somebody who was in psychology for a long time practicing and who does leadership development and things like that. So I've got all of this expertise. I'm well regarded in my field. And here I am trying to make it be okay for somebody who's very clearly not intuitive or emotionally intelligent. And of course, somebody who's intuitive and emotionally intelligent would do just that. But it came to the point where I realized that I can no longer apologize or make it be make other people be okay with who I am. I just have to be myself. And I think that that is the greatest, the greatest call to action, I think, for the intuitives in tech and in healthcare is to allow yourself to be yourself, even at risk of being misunderstood or characterized in a way that you might feel a little bit crunchy about. Do I want people to think that I am weird? Well, at this point in my life, I'm not too attached to that anymore. There was probably a time in my life when I was a little bit younger when, yes, that was a problem for me. I was just reminded of when I was creating my first CV when I was in grad school, I had put things on my CV in addition to all of my, my graduate training work and everything. I'd put things like I was um, certified at the master level or I was, I was attuned to the master level of Reiki, which is an energy medicine modality. And I had been certified in hypnotherapy. And so I put all of these kind of holistic, energetic frameworks that I had been trained in because I had been trained in shamanism and, and holistic healing from the Hawaiian perspective and so on. And I took it to, I think I took it to Barb, who was my mentor in grad school, who was also, she wrote a book on spiritual intelligence and she read my, my CV and she said, Robin, she said this in a very kind and diplomatic way. She said, we have to speak in code on your CV. And what she meant by that is please, she was advising me, please don't put that you have studied Reiki, just put that you've studied holistic therapies. At the time, this was in the early 2000s, it made a whole lot more sense than it does today. Because at the time, we were still pretty much in the early stages of even understanding how some of these modalities work. And since then, of course, we have 20 years of research and data collection and so on that really supports the, I'll call it efficacy of some of these alternative and holistic therapies, things like Reiki and acupuncture and things like that, along with meditation and all the things that I love to do and have found great, great usefulness for in my practice and in my personal life. But at the time, I remember feeling a little bit thwarted by that and a little bit mystified about like, I just want to be out there doing my work. Why do I have to speak in code? Well, we continue, the intuitives among us continue to speak in code in the workplace. And the time really, I believe is upon us where we get to stop speaking in code and we just get to speak in truth instead. And so this is the vital outcome is that when you start speaking in truth and you start saying things like, I know this to be true, and you start saying what you think, what you actually think without couching it and without trying to make it be okay for other people, make it more palatable for other people. But instead, when you just speak in truth, you illuminate the truth for people so that they can actually see the way. When you speak in shadows, when you speak in, in sort of, when you speak in code, the outcomes are also coded. So we have the opportunity right now as we're approaching 2024 to stop speaking in code and just to start speaking truth to illuminate the pathways to this beautiful world that we're creating where wisdom and intuition are the norm rather than the outlier, where it's to be expected that you're going to be both professionally eminent and spiritually intelligent. And I think that's going to be a wonderful day when that arrives. I can really see it happening but it starts with you and it starts with me. And part of this work that I've been doing around identifying and, and initiating women into their highest calling is, is illuminating their own intuition, helping them understand their own intuition. That when you hear whispers of things that are to come or ideas that just come into your mind, but you hear them, 
that's clear audience. It's not that you're crazy and you're not just hearing voices. Or when you know things that other people don't know, that's clear, that's clear, clear cognizance. You just know, you know it in your bones. That is a legitimate way of knowing things. Truth has its own frequency. Truth has its own vibe. It's legitimate. And when you can look into a room and see the energy of the room, that's clairvoyance. You can see what other people can't see. And that is legitimate. So a lot of this early work that I'm doing around initiating women into their highest calling is educating on them on their intuition. You all have it. You wouldn't be here with me if you weren't intuitive. Because this podcast is not for the non-intuitives. The non-intuitives misunderstand me. And that is, that's okay. That's okay. They might even be repelled by me or intimidated by me rather than being illuminated by me. But for you, you're illuminated. So, but you have to understand your intuition and activate it in a way such that it become you become masterful at using it. Because intuition can still make mistakes. We know this. There's been a lot of research on how intuition works and when it works. I've always said, <laughs> because I'm kind of a Star Trek nerd, but I've always said that you wouldn't send, in, intuition does not do well with necessarily guessing numbers or dates. Now, some people would argue and say, well, yes, in fact, intuition is pretty good at guessing numbers. I have not found that to be the case. But when I use the Star Trek metaphor, what I'll say is you wouldn't send Spock to do Bones job. Well, Bones, of course, is the, the doctor, the intuitive one, and Spock is the logical one. So we have to know when to employ our intuition and when to allow our reason, our logic to lead. And you're smart. You're, you wouldn't have gotten as far as you have if you weren't very, very bright and accomplished. So you already know this inherently, but it really is time, I believe, to start allowing your intuition, your spiritual intelligence really, to unfurl itself. And to be very clear about, even if you are in the, in the tech space, especially if you are in the tech space, even if you are in the healthcare space, to allow yourself to start speaking out loud. My intuition says, or this is what I talked about with my intuition teacher, or I'm learning intuition, and just start bringing that word into the workplace. This is going to be a very important anchor for you going forward, because believe it or not, there are a whole lot more people in tech and in healthcare who are profoundly intuitive than are letting on right now. They're all undercover. It's kind of like we have undercover agents working in these fields, but now it's time for them to not be undercover anymore. It's time for you to not be undercover anymore. And so the big message today for you from this, from this episode is, can you, can you allow yourself to express your intuition, regardless of if you're at work or at home, regardless of who's in the room? Can you allow yourself to be your most holy intuitive self? That's the question. I think I know the answer. And let me tell you this, it always helps. I have found when you have people around you who are also willing to just say that they are intuitive, like me. I have a group of colleagues, my friend Elise, you've heard her on the podcast and Andrea has been on the pod and Belgite and Jennifer have all been on the podcast, Christina. <clears throat> We're all intuitives. And when we're together, nobody questions, well, how'd you know that? Nobody asks me to validate what I know. They just take it for what it is because they can hear the truth of it. And it's quite wonderful to have a group of people around me that doesn't question why I know what I know. They just know that I know. And I know that I know. And you know that you know. And so gathering people around you who also are intuitive, even if they're quietly so at work, this is a first phase of really standing in the truth that the world that we're creating is one where wisdom 
and intuition lead. You're wise and you're intuitive and you're a natural leader. That means it's your time. It's your time to be highly regarded. Because the, the old ways, the ways that I mentioned clear at the beginning of the podcast today about you know, what to do next in your life, those old ways are passing away and the new ones were, are not born yet because we're creating them. And you get to create what's next. It's going to be created largely from your intuition, far more so than it is from your logic. Far more it, is it from using a reference to something that has come before. Because you're not interested in replicating the past or doing what somebody else has done just because they've done it. And that seems to be the way everybody's doing it. Instead, you're actually, in some ways, writing the book on what's next, not just for yourself, but for the other intuitives who will come after you as well. This is how we do things here, you can say. And it really starts with getting very, very comfortable with your own intuition, with your own sense of, I trust myself with what I know. And I don't have to explain it. I just know it. And that is a valid way of knowing it. So it's quite remarkable, this precipice we're on into our, the world that we're creating. We are at the beginning of December, end of November, beginning of December of 2023. And intuition is leading the way and it will continue to do so going into 2024 and beyond. The sooner you allow your intuition to come forward and you require your intellect to go back to its proper place as your servant, that's when your world will light on fire. That's when you will be able to step into your highest calling. But as long as you continue to be led around by like a ring in your nose by your intellect, worried about what everybody else is thinking about you, by your ego, how do I prove? How do I compete? When intuition is leading, there's no need to prove and there's no need to compete either. You just be, you just be your whole self. You be your confident self, you be your true self. And that gives rise to the wisdom and intuition leading the way at work. So that is all I have for you today. I'm so glad that you joined me. Thank you for listening. If you found this episode helpful, I'd love to hear from you. Take a screenshot of the episode, post it on socials. Be sure to tag me in it so I can say thank you. And if you know somebody who could benefit from listening to this podcast, please share it with them. This is a grassroots movement. Becoming the channel is the way of the future. Everyone is channeling something. And I want you channeling your highest frequencies, your highest codes, your spiritual intelligence codes as fast as possible so that, as I've talked about all day today, wisdom and intuition lead the way at work and in the rest of your life too. Until next time, I will see you then.